just going to push this back a little bit here, sorry. A little bit. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, I am excited to announce um, that we are continuing our ongoing um, negotiations to try to see uh, between the two houses and with uh, Governor Walker where we'll have an opportunity to find common ground and work together. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know it's hard so to get funny. used to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been saying Governor Doyle, so at least I'm making some uh, progress forward. So um, I'll, I'll, I can start over so you can go to that whole thing. So. <laughs> I didn't even realize the paper for that. Yeah, we're still like uh, thing. Take two. So uh, thank you for being here today. I am excited to uh, talk about the opportunity for us to work with our new governor, Governor Evers, uh, to find ways that we can hopefully find issues to work on together and try at least for the foreseeable future to avoid picking topics that we know are going to be divisive, that we know will draw contrast between the two parties that really aren't necessary, um, especially initially. We're going to have plenty of those fights over the next two years, but it certainly doesn't have to be in the first week. So um, our caucus discussed the issues over the course of the past several weeks, knowing, of course, the outcome of the election. And we tried to brainstorm where are the opportunities for us to find that common ground, work together on things that we believe there really is common ground, not just saying it and then um, trying to put out some kind of a false narrative. So let's just go through quickly some of the areas that we took, uh, looking at the promises that Governor Evers made over the course of his campaign. Um, the first one, income tax reductions. Uh, when I saw Governor uh, Evers' campaign commercials, they focused mostly on two areas, right? Protecting people with pre-existing conditions, uh, which the Assembly had already voted for, uh, and reducing middle income tax uh, taxes. So hopefully that's an area we could find consensus on. Uh, enhancing high-speed internet access. That's something that doesn't affect folks just in uh, small towns or rural areas. There are actually every part of the state uh, that wants to have access to things like 5G. But for a lot of the state, they don't even have access to high-speed broadband today uh, under the current law that we have. So hopefully that's an area we could find some common ground. Uh, I already mentioned pre-existing condition coverage. Uh, certainly that's something that Governor Evers ran on. It's something that I think every one of us want to make sure we have protected. And the best way to do that is to ensure that in state law, we have the guarantee uh, that's protected. So no matter what happens in Washington, no matter what happens with the lawsuit, uh, we know that it will not have an impact on citizens here in the state. I don't want to bet our hopes on a lawsuit uh, becoming successful or not. I want to guarantee it happens in our state. Uh, we know K-12 education is hugely important for all of us. Um, students in every single part of K-12, of course, public schools being the vast majority of students, but also students who are homeschooled, students who are in charter schools or choice. All of those are important, and I think we can find a way to continue to increase opportunities for them. Uh, Republicans supported and created senior care. Uh, we have been the ones, especially in the Assembly, who even when some have proposed to dramatically change it or get rid of it, we saved it. Uh, during the campaign, Governor Evers talked about um, expanding senior care to cover flu shots. I think that's a good idea, one that I would certainly be open to exploring as we go forward. Uh, also, we talked about um, things that especially, and I'll let Jim talk about this one, uh, regarding homelessness. That was very successful last time, and I know uh, Governor uh, Evers talked about that as well. Yeah, and we want to build off the successes we had in the past session with this bipartisan package of uh, bills to help combat homelessness. Obviously, the interagency council was created out of that package of bills. They spent uh, approximately the last year under the leadership of uh, Lieutenant Governor Clayfish um, coming up with recommendations moving forward on how the state can really, for the first time, um, have a concerted effort to end homelessness. Um, those recommendations came out uh, towards the end of this year last year. Uh, we want to work with the incoming administration. I've already talked briefly about it with uh, the lieutenant governor. We want to work with them to, to make sure that these uh, recommendations are implemented and that the work of the uh, interagency council and the advocates that have helped serve on that and uh, helped give information to that uh, council are uh, taken seriously and that this effort uh, continues to move forward. So we know transportation is something that I've heard Governor Evers talk about. Um, he mentioned, I think, just even yesterday uh, at the economic forum sponsored by the Bankers Association. So we know that the debt level in transportation is way too high, so we have to figure out a way to hopefully work together to address the ability to have a sustainable long-term transportation fund that doesn't rely on borrowing, which frankly, every single legislator here um, has voted to increase bonding and transportation, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, over the course of the past decade. So there's a lot of blame to go around. Hopefully there will be a lot of solutions to be found. 
uh, child care affordability. We know that for an awful lot of families, making sure that as we have more and more folks with two people working in the home, uh, child care is going to become a huge issue for families going forward, finding ways to make it more affordable. Uh, under Republicans, uh, enhancing some of the things that Governor Doyle did. Of course, we have our rating system to guarantee we have high quality child care in almost every single, if not all parts of Wisconsin. I think we can do better and we need to make sure we keep working on that. Uh, just this last week, we announced the creation of a speaker's task force on clean water. We're in the process of working uh, with our caucus to figure out the areas that we would specifically focus on. Uh, I think that's an area, of course, once again, wanting to be good environmental stewards. That's not a partisan issue. That's not one party versus the other. Should be everybody wanting to make sure we have access to clean drinking water in the 25% of the state that's on a private well. The vast majority of Wisconsin is on a municipal water system, but that still means there's a whole group of people want to guarantee that the water that they drink and the water that they use every day is safe. Uh, investments in our infrastructure in general. The state of Wisconsin owns over 6,000 buildings. Uh, when I say infrastructure, this is the vertical, not the horizontal. Uh, we own over 6,000 buildings, uh, and we need to make sure we do a good job of guaranteeing that those buildings are well-maintained, that they are um, adequately utilized. So perhaps there are some that can be sold that we no longer need to invest in the opportunity for us to create uh, good long-term sustainable structures uh, to go forward. Uh, and then lastly on our list, uh, attracting quality employees. And that means not just to the state uh, in general, which is for everybody. Uh, we know that I think today uh, Mike Rohrcast and Senator Fine put out some of their talent incentive program ideas. I think some of those are good. We know in the last budget we put together a proposal to increase the activity to attract more people to come to our state. Uh, I think that's something that shouldn't be bipartisan. We're not asking what their party registration is as they move to Wisconsin. We just want them to be here as good, productive workers. Uh, and I think that also is something that we want to highlight for individuals who work inside. That's okay. <laughs> uh, I think we also want to make sure we highlight something for individuals who work inside state government. Uh, all across the state, we have to make sure that we do a job of attracting, <laughs> we have to do a good job of attracting uh, people who want to come and work for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, where I live in southeastern Wisconsin, we are seeing intense wage pressure in almost every single marketplace, and government is not immune. So if you want to become a prison guard or work at Southern Center in my district or work for an awful lot of state facilities, we have to have competitive wages. The good news is, under Republicans over the course of the past four years, employees have gotten a raise every single year. I think that should be something that we can all work together on to guarantee that raises again happen for hardworking state employees and that we try to put money in place to incentivize those hardest to hire positions as we look to make our state as efficient as we can. We still want to make sure that it's a place that people can be um, hopefully gainfully employed for the long term. So this is signed by every single member of our caucus, which I think is a good sign that our team in the assembly is united. Uh, we know that we are in divided government. It's different times. Uh, we've had a lot of these conversations in our caucus to say, how are we going to operate? Um, we are going to have to say yes plenty of times. Uh, that is our job. We're also going to say no plenty of times because that's also our job. Uh, to make sure that we do not let Wisconsin slide backwards, that we keep it moving in a single direction like a ratchet, only going forward. We're not going to go back and relitigate a whole bunch of the tired old arguments that we've already heard for the past decade. People don't want us to focus on the past. They want us to really focus on the future. So I think this is a good faith effort for us to say we're looking at what he promised, what we think we can deliver, and find ways to be able to do that together. Um, there's an LRB being circulated by Representative Peterson and Senator Jacques on pre-existing conditions. Is that your LRB that will be AB1, and do you plan to take it to the floor on the 22nd or next week on the 15th? Sure. Yeah, so I, I would assume that that will probably be the vehicle, whether it's in that form or there's amendments made to that uh, bill over the course of time. Uh, that'll be something that we look at. But we've always been very clear, I think, that we want uh, this bill to be the first bill that we pass out of the gate. Um, so whatever timing that is, whether it's the 22nd or the 23rd, uh, depending on uh, how things work out, that's that's what our plan is. So you don't plan to be on the floor next week? No. Okay, so the, the following week. And um, will that bill have an emergency clause? Does it, will it be spending any money or will it just be a straight bill? Uh, our goal is to not have an appropriation in the bill. Okay. 
Yeah. Now, I will also say that keeping in line with what we're trying to put out as our priorities of working together and listening to each other, uh, next week uh, we are going to be joining our Senate colleagues for the first joint caucus in my legislative career. Uh, where both caucuses get together um, and sit down, number one, and talk with Governor Evers. Uh, that's the first goal that we had. The Assembly Republicans invited him uh, to come right after the inauguration. Of course, he was busy um, going out and promoting his policies around the state, so he didn't have time to meet with us this week, but he did for next week, uh, so I give him credit for that. So we're going to sit down, I think, on Tuesday, along with our Senate colleagues, and have our first real conversation with our new governor. So I think that's also kind of keeping in line with where we want to be. We want to avoid the hyper-partisanship that, unfortunately, far too many have kind of been agitating for. We are trying not to buy in into that. We want to find ways to say let's pick issues we can work together on and show that we can as opposed to picking issues that cause a fight which reinforce what people do not want to hear today which is arguing and complaining. Um, probably close to begin with. I don't want to have it become a political activity. I mean we're trying to do it in a sincere way where you know we don't preen for talking points. We want to have a real conversation but of course we'll have an opportunity to talk to you guys afterward. Speaking of the governor, um, do you have any reaction to his announcement yesterday that he's going to send a letter to the Attorney General changing the stance on the CA lawsuit? Well, um, once again, trying to be as positive as I can be. Um, my goal is to not try to figure out how we can hire smart attorneys to, f to basically have a one-man government. Um, we want to try to find ways to work together. So the reason that we had the special session was to basically require cooperation. So we sit down, we talk like adults, we listen to each other, and we find that consensus. So if one of the first things that he does is to try to find some legalistic language to go around the intent of the legislature, I guess he will have, he has every right to conduct himself as he chooses. Uh, my goal would be to say, how about if the first thing you do is sit down with us, not figure out ways to work around the legislature. So, you know, he has the right to do what he chooses, and if it's partisan gridlock, I really think that would be a sad commentary. I don't want that to be the way that we are. So my hope is, you know, that maybe it's just bad reporting, <laughs> and he's not going to actually do what he's threatening, but we'll see. Mr. Speaker, uh, speaking <coughs> of areas of common ground and compromise, Senator Dave uh, Craig uh, yesterday sent a letter to the governor asking if uh, he would champion and take the lead on reform, uh, repeal actually, to Wisconsin's minimum markup law. What's your position on that actual reform, actual repeal coming out this session? So that's not something that we've talked about um, in our caucus. Uh, of course, I do not believe that the government should be the place where prices are set. But I also know that we have to guarantee that a robust marketplace actually occurs. So <laughs> I have been on record in favor of repealing the minimum markup. I know many in our caucus are not. So I don't want to say that's an area that we can find common ground when, frankly, we have not talked about that on our list of things to put out there as an initial idea. But, you know, we'll certainly have to take a look at what his bill does. On income taxes, uh, Tony Evers says he wants to reduce the, um, the rates by, or the amount by 10% for the middle class which would cost about $300 million. Is that a figure you think that you could hit, or do you need to do something bigger or smaller than that? Well, I don't want to lay down any markers today. You know, the goal of our letter and our conversation next week is to say, look, I'm not trying to, on issues where I think we can work together, say, here's my plan and, you know, take it or leave it. Um, I want to be open-minded to say, let's, let's take some ideas. I'm going to go back as an example and look at what he promised to your question. What did he promise on income taxes? Maybe are there ways we can try to look at his ideas and think about that and get to an answer where I know we could be on the same page. I, I just don't know at this point. And I don't want to presuppose that we have all these answers already worked out where, you know, five days or, you know, a week into the session. I certainly don't want to presuppose that, you know, we've cut any kind of deals because we just haven't. How do you reduce transportation debt? Are you looking at potentially delaying any major projects or do you have any, any specific <coughs> ideas on how you might approach that? Not necessarily. Well, um, and I think that gets back to what uh, the speaker is saying is that in all these issues where we think we can find some common ground, we don't we don't want to come out and say we have all the answers before we're able to negotiate some of this, uh, some of these items with the administration to see exactly where those, uh, where that overlap is, where we can find common ground. The Venn diagram, as it were. Exactly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, not behind on, the, <laughs> on the national level, they're starting to show concerns of um, the U.S. going into recession. Do you have concerns about that? And as you start working through a budget and joint finance, is that something that you guys will be looking long term? 
Yeah, I mean, even today, I think it was today or yesterday, I saw an economist from UW-Madison already began to say that there is the possibility, and they are predicting slower economic growth for this calendar year than we have seen in the past. Uh, of course, there was a, an economist yesterday that at the same event Governor Evers was at talking the same thing from CNBC, so a, a still a growing economy, but one that grows slower. So whatever we can do to make sure that the fantastic growth rate that we have had over the course of the past four years especially, much less eight, can continue are things that I hope we would have bipartisan agreement on. Um, you know, I think that raising income taxes slows the economy. We certainly would not want to do that. Um, Governor Evers talked about cutting taxes. We know that that is a way to juice the economy. So there are some areas that we should all worry about. Um, good news for Wisconsin um, residents, though, is we have the largest rainy day fund in our state's history. So. I don't think we're going to have to use that in this budget, but that's important for us to make sure we keep adding to if we can and that we don't spend until there really is a rainy day. So I don't think it's going to rain in the next six months, God willing, um, but we want to be ready in case it does. Well, and to, to, the speaker's, to the speaker's point, it's, it's, and to your point, your question, going into a budget cycle with the possibility, you know, if you look at economic cycles, I mean, this is about the time when we'd start to see the economy slow down and possibly go into recession at some point in the not too distant future. So that's why we have to be extremely careful in this budget to make sure that we're not growing government to a point that's unsustainable going forward if revenues do start to decline. Mm -hmm. So then uh, following up the rainy day fund, what things would you see as acceptable to use the rainy day fund on to protect to not have to cut? Well, first of all, we're not going to use the rainy day fund in this budget. Um, because I don't think we're in recession or we would use it. Um, if it were up to me, I would love for us to add to the rainy day fund rather than increasing spending because as Jim mentioned, as Representative Steineke mentioned, we're probably going to see recession in the next two, four, six years. So wouldn't it be wise to save as much as we can rather than grow the size of government so we don't have to have reductions to spending on uh, health care for the poor or reductions to schools in a future legislature? So I think we need to be wise stewards. I think we have been over the course of the past eight years, and I don't see that changing under any circumstance. Can you respond to the lawsuit filed today about the lame duck session being a like an illegal uh, convening by the legislature? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> we could we could get into it. I think it's important to remember that one of the reasons uh, we've done what we've done over the course of the last what six years now with the MOUs, the Memorandum of Understandings, is to ensure that all of our members. Have so you're talking about Jimmy Anderson? Yeah. Is yep. that what we're talking about? No. Yeah. There's a no. new lawsuit that just got filed about an hour ago. Yep. Oh, yep. there's so, so many lawsuits being filed. I know. Filed yeah. So, so what did Brand Schimmel say? The way a bill becomes a law, it's passed by the legislature, signed by the governor, and suit is filed in Dane County by liberals. <laughs> I guess that's probably not going to change. Um, so here we are in a circumstance where the legislature passed legislation. It was signed by the governor. Um, I think Governor Evers at the time probably. Um, presupposed what was going to happen when he said they weren't going to follow the law. Then, of course, his advisor said, oh, you have to follow the law, so he changed his stance, and here we are again, um, where his goal, obviously, is to get his liberal allies to do his bidding. That's what it seems like to me. So clearly, we know um, that we have a memo we will share with you. There is absolutely, positively, no doubt that what the legislature did is constitutional because we have the right to convene ourselves in extraordinary session. When we pass a resolution setting our session calendar, it is done by the legislature. It's not signed by the governor. So the dates that we set are actually determined by the legislature and have been since statehood. So just like individuals filed a lawsuit um, talking about the open records law during Act 10, the Supreme Court said the legislature has the right to set its own rules. So I'm sure we will probably waste a bunch of taxpayer dollars on these liberal special interest group raising money from outside special interests to file lawsuits against duly passed laws, which will be a waste of taxpayer money. But we are going to defend the laws that were legally passed, and I am absolutely positively certain that this lawsuit will not have merit in the long run. Now, will a Dane County judge elected by people who obviously do not support um, uh, you know, things that we have done? Uh, probably, wouldn't surprise me, um, but that's what we've dealt with for the past eight years and in almost every circumstance, if not every single one of major issues, they were overturned by a higher court using more wisdom than many Dane County officials have. Now, Attorney General Josh Call would be responsible for defending that. Are you confident that he'll uh, defend the law appropriately? Are you looking to intervene? Well, I am certain we will probably have to intervene, uh, unfortunately. 
Uh, I do not have confidence at this time, based on the statements that he made, even on his inauguration day, kind of throwing down the gauntlet, having the most partisan inaugural address of anybody that day, that he is truly looking to find ways to do his real job, which is to defend past laws of the legislature. Seems like he's more an activist attorney general than one who's going to protect our interests. But, you know, he has the right, obviously, to sit at the same table that we do now under the special session. So the law will be defended. I am confident it will be found constitutional. It will just be the first of hopefully not many, but the first example of where people say one thing uh, and then do another uh, during the course of the, the work that they have. Well, back, back to your letter today, you described this as a gesture of goodwill. Do you feel like the extraordinary session was a gesture of goodwill? Do you feel like staffing up to potentially write your own budget is a gesture of goodwill? Yeah. Why? So let me tell you why. Number one, um, the special session bills that we passed uh, were a guarantee that the way that we operated would be the same way under Governor Walker and Governor Evers. Uh, we also made sure that cooperation was going to be required. The number one thing that I have heard uh, the governor talk about, Governor Evers, since the election day was we want to work together. We want to find common ground. We want to be bipartisan. Well, those bills require bipartisan cooperation. And I understand why he would like to say one thing and do another, which is to be able to file lawsuits trying to say, I can do things whatever I want, regardless of the legislature. Issuing a bunch of executive orders on his first day in office, you know, that is something he can do around the legislature. That's his constitutional right. Uh, but I think what we did was guarantee that cooperation is going to be required, which is what everybody says. We're just trying to make sure it actually happens. On that point, Speaker, uh, do you think that uh, Governor Evers last week, who boldly claimed that uh, he was willing to confront lawsuits in this matter, but then 24 hours later said he thought better of it, do you think that he has seen the light, that the legislature does have this authority to hold an extraordinary session and to effectively do what it did in that session? No, I mean, and I had had no conversation, so what I'm about to say is totally my own supposition because I have no inside information. But I think probably allies of his were already talking with people who work in his administration saying, you don't worry about this, Governor Evers. We've got millions of dollars from outside liberal special interest groups. We'll be the one to go and sue in court so you can look innocent and kind of, you know, kind of say a pox on both your houses. But the reality is I am confident that they knew about these lawsuits. Uh, they kind of presupposed by saying some of those things and then backtracking later. Uh, I, I think that's sad that we are now looking to have outside special interests try to influence the process of how we work together because outside special interests do not have an incentive for us working together. They have an incentive to drive us apart. And especially a lot of these liberal interest groups trying to say we only want one side of the equation, and that's bigger government, higher taxes, more spending, and we're the roadblock. So I hope that he does not go to the worse angels, which are interest groups trying to call the shots. I would hope he would make his own decisions, but that's something he's got to decide for himself. Everyone's been using words like olive branch, cooperation. Even you said right now we're going to start with the things we agree on. How long do you expect this spirit of cooperation to last, or are we just talking when will the real work Real arguments do you think take place? Sure. So here's an example. Um, I hope that the majority leader and I and the rest of our leadership team have the opportunity to go and sit down with Governor Evers and talk about what he wants to do inside the budget. Because what I have seen, the things that he has announced so far, are really partisan. They are things that he knows we probably won't be able to agree with. Well, I would rather start with the things that we can agree on, build some momentum, build some consensus to show that, yeah, we can tackle issues together. So, you know, I hope that the budget he introduces sometime probably in late February, uh, we're going to give him a small extension because we know he has to organize himself. Um, the deadline really is the 31st, but we're going to let him go beyond that, that he needs to have an opportunity to think about this and not say I'm going to do a wish list of the Democratic Party planks that were adopted at their state convention, but how about the things we know we can bring together? Well, and as you can see, I mean, this is a long list of items that we believe as a caucus uh, that we can work with the incoming governor on based on his own statements during the campaign and after. And <clears throat> this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, there are other things that came up during this caucus where there were plenty of other items that we thought we could work on. These are ones that we felt confident work, uh, listening to Governor Evers' comments that uh, we could work on together initially. 
going forward, we could, we could spend the whole session not only on these issues, but some of the other ones that were mentioned during our caucus. We don't have to get divisive. So it's all going to depend on Governor Evers and how he chooses to govern over the course of the next three, six, nine months, and two years, really, on uh, if there is any divisiveness in this uh, session. Does that mean you hold off on releasing your own budget until you see what the governor proposes? Oh, there is no doubt. Okay. My goal is not to craft our own budget. I would love to be able to use Governor Evers' budget and make changes like we do with all of the previous governors. But that starts with the basic understanding that we are not going to raise income taxes, period. So if you build your budget on a billion dollar tax increase, that basically means the entire budget can't be built using that. We might have to go and do our own budget. That's not what I want. He knows we're not going to raise income taxes, so why would you propose that? He knows we're not going to expand Medicaid and putting more people on government-dependent health insurance. Why would we put that in the budget knowing it's never going to happen? So my hope is that he looks and says, let's do like we did. Take the areas that we can agree on, use that to build the budget, and then we can dis disagree or agree on how much should we send on public schools, how much should we cut taxes, how much should we spend on raises for our state employees. Those are things we can find consensus on. But the idea of saying we're going to build it on a house of sand just so I can please some people in a, the far left wing of the Democratic Party, I don't know how productive that would be. Okay, so if he includes the manufacturing and um, ag tax at a credit great reduction and he includes Medicaid expansion, then do you go to your own budget? Well, it depends on what he's going to do. I mean, let's think about it. That's a massive tax okay. increase. We're not going to do a massive tax increase. I don't think that's, you know, nobody who watches thinks Republicans are going to raise income taxes. I don't think that's a, that's a foregone conclusion. I think that if you look and say, do we want more people in government-run health care? We do not. We want the private sector to work. In fact, don't forget, we're the ones who put $100 million into propping up Obamacare because we want people to have private sector insurance, not government-funded public insurance. So I think there's a lot of ways that if he was honest about it, the budget can't be built on those. But he's got to make those choices first. I'm not going to say, you know, if, if he did one and we could maybe figure a way to take it out and still have the rest of the budget be sustained. But if he puts in dozens of Democratic policy planks, it, it's just not going to work. Don't you think that you're sending mixed signals when you say we want to work with the governor and help him build his budget, but you and Fitzgerald have both been in the media saying you're planning on working on the budget from base? Which tells the well, governor from that. day I didn't one say that. that you're. Yeah. I've never said that. The speaker has. Yeah, because that's that. That might end up being what we have to do, but it's not my first goal. My first goal would be let's do what we've done in the past, which is to find areas of consensus and work together. Now, if he wants to, I mean, let's remember, total new spending over the course of the next two years, according to the Fiscal Bureau, is about one and a half billion dollars. So if he proposes a billion-dollar tax increase on top of that, well, it's going to be pretty hard to make the budget work the way he wants with a billion dollars more of revenue than we know we're going to spend. So that's why it makes no sense to me to put in tax increases that are never going to happen, building a budget around that, and then complaining that we might have to build our own budget because you're kind of setting up a false narrative. What would you agree to on transportation? I don't want to draw lines in the sand. I mean, that's why I think if you look at the Assembly last time around, we proposed a plan that raised, what, 300 million, you know, in revenues in exchange for tax cuts. So that that's something that I think we could look at, right? I mean, I don't want to pick a number. I want to let let him let him have his ideas, sit down with his own department, figure out what his positions are, because of course he's new to the job. I, I respect that. So I, I'm, we're trying to say here are areas that we would love to sit down and get a better understanding of where you are, as long as it's reciprocated. We want to do the same thing. This is what our ideas are, and maybe he would include some of those in his own budget, so we don't have to go it alone, because so, I don't think that's productive. So what happens if your caucus and the governor are closer together on transportation than you in the Senate? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you are going to see. I think you are going to see this session that the first thing that we are doing as uh, mutual caucuses is something that hasn't been done in ever that we can remember. The Senate and the Assembly are going to sit down because we are going to be united on the vast majority of issues because we understand that there's one group who is here with the main job to protect the taxpayer and that's the Republicans in both chambers. So I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of disagreement between the Senate and the Assembly because we understand that it's our job to stop the growth of government at a rate that Wisconsin taxpayers can't afford. Do you think the Senate and Assembly would be united on the issue of transportation? I hope so in the end. I mean, once again, we have not had those discussions to say, okay, what's realistic? Yeah. I think that, as I said, there's a lot of blame to go around on transportation. We raised bonding too high. 
Uh, I think that was you know something like I say that Senate Democrats have voted for too much bonding, and so have Senate Republicans. Assembly Democrats have voted for too much bonding, so have Assembly Republicans. So there's a lot of blame to go around, and I'm not going to start pointing fingers or saying it's my way or the highway or drawing lines in the sand on things that I think we can find a legitimate way to work together. Members of the uh, Senate GOP side don't seem very thrilled with Craig Thompson, the lobbyist, being uh, uh, named by the governor as his uh, Department of Transportation Secretary. How do you feel about uh, Thompson serving in that capacity? So I am willing to comment on almost anything, but I have zero say in the confirmation process, right? I mean, they have to have hearings, they have to listen. I will say this, I, I knew Craig before um, as staffers. I think as a person, he is a good person, uh, 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 well respected. You know, whether or not he is too close to one interest group or another, that's something the Senate's got to talk about. But as a human being, I think he is a good person. And I think that, um, you know, I just want to comment on somebody who knows him that way. I don't, I don't, I'm not going to comment on his other person. All right, thanks everyone. Okay. Thank you. Which letter? Which letter? Oh, of course, he knows all about it. Yeah, he knows about the letter. So they're going to all be together with us next week. I, I just think that's a, it's a hugely important sign in a, in, in a way that the people of Wisconsin want everybody to get along, right? I mean, so, yes, have we argued with the Senate in the past over policy? Yes, we have. But now we have to remember we're on the same team. You know, we want very, very similar goals. We're arguing over, you know, small nuances between what the Senate and the Assembly believe. There's big differences with the executive branch. So we got to remember that we have to stand united and find ways to work together. Who, who talked about making this a joint caucus meeting? I, I don't recall seeing one of those. Because that was your idea rather than the executive branch's idea. Oh, no. That we in, so we invited Governor Evers last yeah. week to come to our, our caucus. In my discussions with Senator Fitzgerald, literally, when you and I went over, was it Wednesday? Uh, yes. Tuesday. I kind mean, of forget the days. Tuesday, we sat with the first thing meeting we had was with Jim Bob. And we said, hey, we're looking to invite. He couldn't come this week because he's doing a statewide tour. We're doing it next week. Would you consider it? And he thought about it, and he came back and said, sure, let's all do it together. So hopefully it's something that could happen more often than once. I mean, I think that would be a healthy thing for us as a legislature. Can you speak to this issue, too, where Finn says that you're offering more staff that came along with the request that all the Democrats vote for you as speaker, and that's part of the reason he rejected that? So what I said to him is, look, we have had a really good track record of having the first day of session be as bipartisan as it possibly could be, right? When Republicans were in the minority, we did not run somebody against them for speaker. When Democrats were in the minority for under Peter Barca, they did not run somebody because it was counterproductive. We have an MOU that we can negotiate where we want to do that. Well, in the meeting that I had with Gordon, he rejected the idea that we were going to probably be able to get an MOU done and said, well, I don't know if we can not run somebody against you. I said, well, that's your right, but it seems like it's going to start the day off on a pretty bad foot. Why would you do that when we kind of all know what the conclusion is going to be? It's not like it's a, you know, it's not like it's a, you know, a truly competitive race. So I just feel like, you know, under Peter Barca, and that's why I said kind things about him, because I think he was somebody who looked for consensus. It wasn't aggrieved, you know, didn't look for every reason to be angry. Um, and I look at the first day of session and think, well, geez, all of our families are there. What was the purpose of that when we literally left right after that and had a joint um, party where we invited them to participate? We wanted to do it together on the first day for the inauguration so that both sides could be together. So, you know, he has the right to govern and have his own leadership style. It's just not the same as the one that we've dealt with. And I, I hope it's not a precursor of what the balance of the session will be, which is looking for every reason to not find consensus and be aggrieved when we offered to create what would have been one of the largest minority leader offices in the entire country. And he said, because they're not going to do it the way we've always done it, no. Okay, well, that's his right. All right, thanks. The second okay, time. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You guys all get a copy of the letter. <laughs>